My name is Tyler Condi, and I am excited and honored to share part one of my first interview on the Primed Fatherhood podcast. My guest inspires all who meet him and hear the story of how he has overcome the horrific pain and hardship that followed an IED explosion during a combat mission in Afghanistan. His life-threatening injuries led to 84 surgeries, deep depression, and an altered life, but he has not let this difficult road deter him from living a full and admirable life. Travis Wood is a U.S. Army sergeant, a father, an elite athlete, an amputee, a high school science teacher, and a servant of God and all he meets. Please listen to his story. You will be motivated to push yourself. You will learn his motivation and how he manages his everlasting pain, his attitude, and his responsibilities to his wife and three kids. We have answered the call. We are committed to a greater purpose. We are fathers. Past achievements do not guarantee future success. We will prime ourselves often to navigate each new challenge. We are capable, brave, and relentless. We will remain undaunted. Travis, I'm really excited to have you here to uh, talk today, and I'd like to start just by having you kind of tell us the story of of how you sustained your major injuries and uh, what your recovery process was like. Okay. Um, well, I was uh, <clears throat> on a combat mission, and I left in uh, 2006 to go to southern Afghanistan for Operation Enduring Freedom. And uh, left with 10th Mountain Division, um, and we got over there, and it was chaos from day one. As soon as we got there, it was always busy. Part of my job was recovery, and I was a recovery asset. So uh, at the time, in what we called RC South, the enemy or the Canadian and the British were utilizing our vehicles because theirs were not nearly as good. And so anytime they went on a mission with our stuff, I had to go with them. And so we do a lot of different things. And, uh, one day I got called out to go on a recovery mission to recover one of these vehicles. Um, and at this point it had, um, when we were going out, we always had operating procedures and they always kind of put my vehicle in the middle of the convoy. Cause it was what we call a soft target. Hmm. Um, no heavily weapon, heavy defended weapons in there. Uh, it's not like the Humvees or MRAPs where they have weapon systems on top. My weapon defense is what I carried on me. So pistols, uh, my rifle, grenades, and if I was in good good relationships with supply, an AT4 behind my head. Um, and so the enemy liked to go for those targets a lot. And uh, so I was the fifth vehicle in a convoy of seven going to recover this downed vehicle for the Canadian Army. And... Uh, you know, procedure is when you're looking and you're going on your night ops, you have your NVS 14, which is a single eyelet night vision goggle so that you can keep your firing eye adjusted to the night. Mm. And we're looking around and you're supposed to always scan your sector, scan for anything that looks out of the normal. And the fourth vehicle, the one right in front of me goes, Hey, over the comms, they go, there's something, there's some sketchy road up ahead, follow the tracks in front of me. And, uh, before I can even relay anything, the blast went off and, uh, a wall of fire comes up and I start to fly into the air and, uh, I come down and I hit the ground really hard and I blacked out for a split second. When I come to, I'm hanging halfway outside the vehicle and there's fire everywhere. And it's, you know, (laughs) I used to hate the drills that I got in the army because (laughs) they just beat it into you, beat it into you, beat it into you. Um, and they always say it's like, it's going to be like second nature if things happen. And it 100% is, I am so grateful for the United States army for the training that they gave me because when I got blown up, I didn't feel pain. I didn't feel anything. I, I, I came to, I'm hanging halfway outside the vehicle and I realized that I just got blown up. So first thing I'm doing reactor spawn. So I reached for my rifle and it was in my door and my door had been blown completely open. And so then I'm like, okay, well I need to defend myself. And so I reached for my pistol, which was on my IBA, my Kevlar vest and, and on, in front of my sappy plates. And uh, it was gone. And I, and I got poked and I looked down and there's smoke all up coming up from me. And my, my vest is pretty much shredded. 
And so then I realized I didn't have a defense. So my magazines were gone. My grenades were gone. All of that stuff was gone. And at the time, they were trying to capture, you know, U.S. soldiers to to make uh, examples out of them, if you mm-hmm. if you were. And I wasn't about to do that. So I flipped my harness, and then the top half of my body falls to the ground. And that was the first time I actually started to feel the pain. Um, I felt this deep, deep, like, grind pop feeling inside. And my brain still working a million miles an hour, just like a drill sergeant is yelling at me in my head, get out, get out, get out. But my arms were moving in slow motion, and I could not... I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even move pebbles out of the way. And it was just at that point that my buddy who was in the vehicle with me comes around and he's got blood just dripping down his face. He goes, Travis, I can't see anything. Are you okay? I said, no, man, something's wrong with my back. I can't quite move. So he hooks underneath me and he starts pulling me. And as he's pulling me, I couldn't help myself. I just, I just started screaming, um, just excruciating pain. Um, I guess the comparison I could say, it literally felt like my body was being pulled in half. And uh, he pulls me, and as my leg hits the ground, he stops. And I caught my breath, and I, and I apologized. I said, dude, I'm so sorry. I'm trying not to scream. Let's get to this ravine get away from cover. Because mm-hmm. at that point, there was a hydraulic tank on my recovery vehicle that hadn't detonated or ignited. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to have hydraulic fluid on me because it would never go out. And mm-hmm. I did not want that. But he had stopped because my leg was on fire, and I didn't even realize it. So he pats me out pulls me the rest of the way into the ravine. And at that point, the rest of the convoy already had a 360 perimeter. Um, They were all secure. The medics were already there on standby. And as soon as I got to the spot where they were, the medic cut all my clothes off. And as soon as he took my top off, he says, I need a helicopter now. And uh, operating procedure at that point in, in Afghanistan when I got hurt, which was January 15th, 07, was... If you can roll them out in a vehicle, you need to roll them out of the vehicle because assets, air assets were expensive and in short supply. And so I knew it was pretty serious at that point. But then the medic comes, you know, they're cutting things off and I'm bleeding all over the place and and there's spots I'm trying to help them. So I had to put my finger inside holes of my body to try to stop bleeding and, and, and assist in that way. But the medic's asking me questions and then they ask me the stupidest question you can ask somebody that just got blown up. Travis, where does it hurt? (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I, n- you know, needless to say, I, I found every way to use a profanity on the planet. <laughs> I called them, you know, retarded. You know, you're supposed to be a doctor. How, you know, then they told me to calm down and I'm, you know, yelling at him. I said, I'm, I can't be calm. I'm laying on the ground. I'm naked in Afghanistan. I feel like my hair follicles hurt. So if that answers everything, can we just check that box? So anyways, they start going, they're dressing my wounds and I'm bleeding pretty bad out my side. And it wasn't in a spot that they can put a tourniquet. And so they were trying to pour this, uh, we, we called it quick clot, but this little powder stuff mm-hmm. to help coagulate the blood. And, and things are going, they're trying to dress things, they're getting me to talk. And time keeps going by and the medic's like, where's the helicopter, guys? Where's the helicopter? And then more time goes by, keeps asking that. And I thought that was a little weird at first. Um, but then... I started to, my eyes were burning really bad. And so I closed my eyes and the, the medic slapped me in the face. And he says, and, I, and then I said, what did you hit me in the face for? He says, dude, you got to keep your eyes open. I said, listen, my eyes are burning. I have smoke in them. I have my finger helping you plug wounds. I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm responding every time my eyes burn. I'm going to close my eyes. And so I closed my eyes again and he slapped me in the face again. And then I tried, you know, doing the whole rank thing and, mm-hmm. you know, being the tough guy I was. And, but then things started to change. Uh, I started to actually feel like, you know, like when you shut a computer down and it makes that noise and it shuts down. I literally felt like my systems of my body were literally just turning off. And at that point, I started to realize, okay, I think this is it. And, And I... It's weird to say, but I felt I felt an overwhelming sense of peace when that happened. And I was like, okay, well, I love my family, and I guess this is it. And I started to shut down, and my eyes closed. And I remember the medics yelling at me. I can hear them, Travis, please open your eyes. Please do this. Please, you know. But it was as if somebody had anchors holding my eyelids shut and my my mouth. I couldn't open or do anything. But I get this. Next thing I know, I get this super hot sensation in my ear. And I was enough to snap me out of it. And I come to and being the tough guy I thought I was, I, you know, said, you do that again, you're going to be laying on the ground next to me. And, um, I didn't realize my body was shutting down, Mm. but next thing I, next memory I have is I, uh, 
remember them saying, the chopper's here, and then they all laid on top of me. They were trying to cover me because the chopper was bringing up dirt, and the dirt in Afghanistan was just awful. Uh, no plumbing, and, and you know they've been digging holes and going to the bathroom for decades, centuries even, and so it, it's pretty nasty stuff. It, when we set ground, set foot on ground, we all got sick. Hmm. It was that bad. Um, so I, I remember them putting me in the or getting me, and in I was in a gurney, and they started lifting me and putting me inside the helicopter. And as soon as I got in the helicopter, my body was pretty well strapped down. I remember getting kissed in the forehead by my buddy Wayne, who was in the vehicle with me. And uh, he said, everything's going to be okay. And I remember I had a breathing mask on, a seat collar, but my right arm was a little bit free, and I felt like I was suffocating while I was in the helicopter. So I took the mask off. I guy put it on kind of fought like that for a little Mm -hmm. while and then he put the mask on and he held it there and i didn't have any strength or the coordination to remove it so i was like trying to find my face and it wasn't working and uh and anyway so it was at that point that that was my last official memory before i lapsed into a coma and uh you know they were apparently my, my buddy when they were um trying to give blood uh, when I got to the uh, hospital in Afghanistan, uh, I, apparently I was screaming and stuff, but I don't remember. I was I was out, but I wound up lapsing into a coma, and uh, I was in a coma for was it around a month or something like that, something a little around that time frame. Um, and then, uh, and, and when I came to, I was in Washington D.C. I didn't realize that, but uh, when I came to, I had tubes in my throat. Um, tubes in my mouth and my nose. I couldn't move anything but my fingertips, but I can look around the room. And I was looking around the room and I was thinking to myself, okay, well, I know I got blown up. I know I was hurt. This is a really nice room. So I'm definitely not in Afghanistan because that was a tent. And I said, I bet I'm in Germany. It was at that point that my wife walked in and then I realized I probably wasn't in Germany. Um, And then it started this ongoing process of uh, recovering at an army hospital in Washington, D.C., the old Walter Reed, um, for two and a half straight years. Um, So what wound up happening to me was my spinal cord was broken in six different places. Um, Where it goes down into your pelvis, it's your sacrum area, your S1 through S4 vertebrae. It actually dissociated or detached from my spinal cord uh, and my pelvis, severing the nerves on the right side of my leg, initially diagnosing me as being paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, I'd broken three ribs. One actually detached and it went through my lung. So now I only have partial lung capacity on that right side. Um, my pelvis was completely crushed, and I, I wound up having this external fixator, this halo, trying to bolt it back together to make it have some kind of a shape. Um, I lacerated my kidneys, almost lost both of them. I lost a foot and a half of my small intestine and eight inches of my large intestine. Um, my sternum was broken from resuscitation. I broke my right temporal bone and then they had to fix it from the inside out. Um, I, uh, lost both of my right, both, both of my right, both of my oblique muscles. So I have no more oblique muscles on either side almost all of my right butt cheek. So instead of a gluteus maximus, I have a concavicus now. (laughs) Um, And then I had massive like second and third degree burns down the right side of my body, Um, complete nerve damage on the right side. Um, And then uh, obviously I'm missing my right leg above the knee. Um, But the worst part was when I got blown up, they covered the bomb with dead animals because their goal was not necessarily to kill you. It was more to maim you. Mm-hmm. And so I wound up getting really bad infections while I was in the hospital. I got two different strands of E. coli and this acinetobacter thing that caused ne- necrosis eating away of the skin. And so that was the the decay of the animals getting into yeah and and it just it wrecked my body and it actually spread to the bone to where now i have this bone infection for the rest of my life um but i was in and out of surgeries for um two and a half years i lived at the hospital in washington dc i was told i was never going to walk again and uh we believed it was true because i wasn't able to do much of anything for about six seven months and then started being able to look at my toe and then started being able to bend my knee and the doctors are army doctors so they're like like me and they said well you know how when you cut the head off a snake and it wiggles around and stuff i said yeah they said, well, that's that's what's happening. Don't read into it. I said, okay. So they had no faith that you were actually moving. <laughs> no. Uh, the, the science and the medical, because my spine was still not attached to my pelvis, I had to lay in this bed 
for almost 11 and a half straight months that can only go up 13 degrees because they left my back broken to work on my pelvis and my insides. Mm. So my abdomen was left open with a gauze and with this little plastic saran wrap tape stuff. It was left open. So then when I go in for surgeries, they just pull it off and start working on me. Um, Mm. And they did that forever. And so... Um, it wasn't until I started being able to do a little bit more than they realized there might be something to it. And uh, science and medical medical science cannot explain because there's still gaps between the right side of my sacrum and my pelvis, but somehow I'm able to walk. There's a, a piece of rod and stuff going across that way, and I'm able to walk. So I took my first couple of steps in the parallel bars. It was close to a year into my recovery, and... Uh, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, Uh, you know, to think within a year, I completely forgot how to do something I've been doing since I was an infant. It took me about 45 minutes to take those three steps. And it was uh, a a truly humbling experience. And I had the help from my physical therapist who was a former Chicago bears. So he pretty much held me while I walked. So I can't even take credit for that. (sighs) But, uh, but yeah, two and a half years in the hospital. And then uh, I got released and, and then I moved back here to Cedar city. So, um, when you took those first steps, was that full above the knee amputee at that point? So no, at that that... point it was not. So I was trying to do what they call limb salvage because they told me I was never going to walk again. And so I'm like, well, if I'm going to be in a wheelchair, I at least want to kind of look halfway presentable. I don't want to look, you know, it was, I'll tell you this, you know, I have amazing respect for people that are wheelchair bound because I'll I'll be 100% honest with you. When I was in my wheelchair, it was very hard for me. It was hard for me because I, I, it was psychologically affected me because people looked down and they treated and talked to me different. And I just wanted people to see me that I was still a normal person and and I could not get past that. So it was really hard for me. Um, but yeah, so I, I, uh, I took those three steps and it was an extraordinarily humbling experience. So I tried keeping my leg for a little while. Um, that was actually my last surgery, surgery number 84. So I wound up having a total of 84 surgeries while I was in the hospital. And thankfully, underneath my clothes, with, with clothes on, I look fairly decent. You know, I have my amputation scars all over the back of my head from shrapnel. But uh, underneath my clothes, I kind of look like a human Picasso. And, you know, props to my amazing wife. Thankfully, I'm married because, you know, <laughs> I don't think anybody wants that kind of noise anymore. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, those three steps were absolutely humbling. Um, the hardest thing I ever did, and it completely changed my perspective on what was possible. You know, it was the first time in my life I genuinely had nothing else to give. Those three steps was literally all I had on a physical, emotional, spiritual, mental. Every aspect of my being went into those three steps, and I was completely wrecked for five days after that. I couldn't do anything. Um, it, I've never been, aside from laying on the ground in Afghanistan, I have never been that sore. Uh, from anything and and it was it was quite remarkable you know you you hear coaches when you're in high school and stuff give it all give 110 percent and stuff and and i guess i never truly understood what that meant until that day um because that was honestly the the hardest thing i've ever done in my life so yeah wow that's incredible um i want to go back a little bit so when you first sustained the injury How long had you been married? So I got married in 2002 uh, to my wife. um, Or was it three? So I've been married almost 18 years in March. Um, So I had been married. When we got married, actually, the day we got married, I got a phone call uh, saying, hey, you need to report in 24 hours. And uh, it was an hour before our wedding. And I told them, I said, I'm getting married. They're like, you need to report or you're AWOL. So I didn't tell my wife. It was the one lie Hmm. I've ever honestly said to my wife in our almost 18 years of marriage. I didn't tell her um, until after we got married because I didn't want her to not marry me. Mm -hmm. Uh, But 17 (laughs) days after I left, we were on our first deployment. And then I've done a couple since then. But then this point, uh, I was married for about two and a half, three years. And I had my one daughter, Madeline, and she turned one uh, in January of 06. And then I left in that March. And so we were married for a little over three years, I think, at that point. So 2006 and uh, uh, pretty much almost half of my marriage has been either gone on deployments or in the hospital uh, recovering. And so um, 
you know, I'm grateful because my wife and I built a very strong foundation at the beginning uh, by which when we go, when we've gone through the adversity we have, we've been able to really go back to those and hold tight to that and then rebuild when everything else falls apart, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, we've been taken down to the foundation at least three or four different times in my marriage. Um, and thankfully that foundation stays but, uh, you know, oftentimes we have to rebuild and the house looks a little different every time we rebuild it. But, uh, but it, it's, you know, that's the one thing we committed to each other is, is making sure that that stays strong where it's at. Yeah. Um, definitely a good sign if you're starting off with a deployment, getting called, you know, the night before you're getting married and, uh, <laughs> and she sticks around, so... That's really good. I pay her a lot to like me, so. So, yeah. Um, what do you think is the the keys to that foundation that you guys built right off the bat that got you through that initial horrific two years in the hospital? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, foremost my wife and I both had the common goal of, of an eternal family, a forever family. You know, because of our beliefs, we, we believe in being married forever. And uh, we we have stayed firm in that and centered our life around our faith and and around our belief in a way that we know that we can always rely on our Savior for our for any of the struggles that we have. We may not understand what happens, and I won't lie. There are times where both of us are like, holy crap, why? Seriously, you need to stop because this is this is about going to kill us. Mm -hmm. And, And we've had that you know, even recent times where it's continual struggle. I mean, it, it's hard for me to walk. It's hard for me to do the things I do now. And it's been over 10 years since I got injured. Um, but uh, that that firm foundation of, of, of the gospel in which my wife and I share and, and our faith has, has been that um, goal. It separates us from the world, in my opinion. You know, I love the things of the world. I love cars. I'm a huge car guy. I love, I love all the amazing technologies that we have. But centering my life around something that's firm and never changing was important to my wife and I. Mm-hmm. So that when you go into an ever changing world, you have firm footing and you don't get swayed by this or that, and you get you don't get taken in a direction you don't want to be in the long run. So I think that's definitely been our, our foundation right there. That's awesome. Um, the last time that I heard you talk about the story, you talked about how difficult it was to be in the hospital for that long and how much your daughter Maddie uh, played a part in that. Can you yeah, elaborate so on that? One thing, I'll, I'll tell you this right now, for me, especially now more than ever, uh, my family is everything. I literally would be nothing without them. Um, when I was in the hospital, I was in a very dark place. Um, I was the sole provider for my family. I did everything. My wife never had to worry about anything. I always was willing to work. And our goal when we talked about having kids was if we could afford to do it, we would always have one person stay at home to raise our child, if that was at all humanly possible. So there were times I even took on three jobs to make that happen because I wanted my wife, because I knew she was a great mother and she was going to give our kids exactly what we both believe they needed to have and be the good example they needed. And so I had a very dark place in my life when I was in the hospital. When I, going back to when I was still not able to communicate, uh, was when my dark feelings first started. I, I still had tubes in my throat, tubes in my neck. I had uh, tubes in my mouth, in my nose, everywhere. And I couldn't communicate with my wife. And in my mind, when I was, I had this little uh, notepad and I was starting to write things because when I, when I came out of my coma, I looked at my wife and she looked like she hadn't slept in weeks, mm-hmm. which was true. And so all I was trying to tell her was to go home. So I got my pen and I started to write and my wife started crying. And then when she showed it to me, it was scribbles. And I was completely confused. I thought she mixed up the paper that I gave her. But I tried writing again and it came out the exact same way. I had lost the ability to communicate with my wife. Part of that was because of my brain injury. Part of that was because of medication and other things. And I was, in a, I was messed up. That's, mm-hmm. not, that's not even discounting that at all. Um, 
But then I tried to remember that my wife and I taught my daughter some sign language as a baby. So I was trying to do sign language, but my hands weren't doing anything. And then in the ICU, they had this little card that had pictures. And I was trying to point to that, and it wasn't working. And I remember feeling so hopeless, thinking my first, my first thought that led me down a dark path for a while was, my wife's going to have to take care of me the rest of her life. She deserves so much better than this. I can't do this to her. I'm, I'm worthless. I literally am now just consuming oxygen. What she, she should never have to be with that. And, and that, was my, that was my thought. And it brought me down a really bad path. And fortunately, I only had to be in the ICU for six weeks. And then I stabilized. And I continued to have these thoughts. Like, my wife would do better without me. Mm-hmm. We should just, you know, maybe I'll have a bad procedure and I'll just pass away. I kept thinking that, kept thinking that. And then my wife told me that, you know, my daughter, my daughter Maddie was going to be coming. And so my whole life changed that day and, uh, and, and the weeks to come. Um, my daughter was two when I got injured. And so four days after her birthday is when I got blown up and injured. And, uh, and she came to that hospital and she was in her beautiful little princess dress. Hmm. And I remember as soon as she walked in the door, I just started sobbing. I still wasn't able to communicate very well. But I just started sobbing. I remember my heart just melting all over again, seeing this beautiful little girl. And uh, she was very timid at first because I had tubes all over me. I had a big metal thing around my body. And I looked like a wreck. I mean, I was scary looking. But she carefully climbed up into that bed and she looked at my face. And then she realized that I was dad. And then what she did was every day she'd come and see me that next day. She didn't stay long that first day. But that next day, she changed my perspective forever. She climbed up into that bed ever so gently because she knew that daddy had owies Mm -hmm. and she didn't want to hurt his (laughs) owies. And she would climb up into that bed with her pretty little princess dress and she would hand me a Polly Pocket. And when she handed me that Polly Pocket, (laughs) she, uh, she changed my world. I realized that my thoughts were selfish. I realized that I was the one thinking that I'm an inconvenience. I never once thought to ask my wife. I never once thought to see the perspective of my child. But my child showed that to me without me even having to ask. She said, you're my dad with this Polly Pocket and you're going to be my dad and you're supposed to be my dad and you're supposed to do this and it doesn't matter what you are now you're my dad forever. And so she taught me, a two-year-old taught me something that I could never, ever repay. She taught me that I still had a role and that I mattered and that regardless of, uh, regardless of my circumstance, regardless of what my appearance is, my physical limitations, mental limitations, because at that point I still had, I don't know, five to seven minute memory Mm -hmm. Uh, for new short-term stuff. It didn't matter that. It mattered that I was her dad and that I had a role and that there was still a plan. And I realized that, you know, my daughter, I believe that my father in heaven talked to me through my daughter and told me, hey, you need to stop being dumb and you need to realize what you still have. (laughs) And so from that day on, I started to try to change my perspective. And it was really hard because... In a hospital, you're told what you can't do, what you can't do, what you can't do. You're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. And, and it's, it's hard not to believe it. Uh, so I started having to make a list of the things that I had good. And, and I cherished those little memories, those little experiences with my daughter. We'd lay in that hospital bed. We'd make forts you know, on my hospital bed, use the little TV <laughs> arm to make a fort. We would watch Phineas and Ferb, still to this day, my favorite show on the planet because of that. We would do things together, and then she would model all of her little princess dresses. She'd change like nine times while we were in the hospital. And it's gross, but she used to play on the floor, lay on the ground and color and stuff on the Mm -hmm. hospital floor. It's really gross to think about. (laughs) You know, it's amazing that nothing ever happened to her Mm -hmm. that way. But uh, she became a pillar of strength for me. But it was even more remarkable. The strength of a children, of a child, is actually... It's, it's intoxicating to people. Uh, my daughter actually became almost a mascot to, to all of the people on my ward, which was an orthopedic ward, people with amputated legs and stuff like mm-hmm. that. 
uh, she became a mascot so much that uh, it, she got people out of bed when they didn't want to get out of bed. She pulled them out because they were curious what she was going to wear the next day. And that Easter, she had like 50 Easter baskets from all the guys in the hospital that were stuck in their beds Mm -hmm. just because they wanted to watch her open and dress in a new outfit. And it gave them strength. And that's what my daughter did. She gave me strength and and the ability to, to push myself farther than what I thought I was going to do because my physical limitations, they stopped me a lot. And there was a lot of pain. There still is. But... I learned one day when they were trying to fix or change part of my wounds that when they had to roll me because my spine was still broken, I I winced in excruciating pain and my daughter looked up coloring from coloring for a split second and she had the saddest look on her face. And I chose that day that I was going to try to mask my pain, try to force myself not to display it, not to show it, to try to even overpower the pain that I'm having with my mental focus. And and I strive for that every single day until I get to where I'm at today where I'm able to do a lot of the things I do and I haven't had any kind of medication since 2009, um, aside from the occasional ibuprofen when mm-hmm. I fall and get all swollen. <laughs> but, uh, you know... My pain is never gone, but thinking about my daughter and how she sees when I am in pain helps me to 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 gain that strength, to dig as deep as I possibly have to, to be able to overcome that. So to clarify that part of it, you want to mask your pain not because you feel like you're showing weakness, but because it's painful to her to yes. see it. Yeah, so to clarify, pain... Pain is real, and, and and I'll be the first to validate anybody that has any kind of issues, whether it's physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain. I, I, I can empathize, and I have been there, and I know it's real. It's never going to go away. No, showing your pain is not weakness. Um, I mostly learned and, and strived to mask my pain in a way or, or do things to co- to make my pain more manageable so that I didn't have to let my family worry because I got to a point when I was at the hospital in my recovery where I started to be a little bit more independent. And then I started to realize, you know what? I think I might be able to be a dad again. I might be able to do this. And and I, I, I was wanting that role. And it was so hard for my wife because she didn't know what was going to happen to me. And, you know, she got told for days and weeks that it's 50% chance your husband's going to live through the night. It's 50% chance. She got told that over and over and over again. And no no fault of her own. It was hard for her to learn to rely on me because she didn't know if I was going to be there. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted that role. I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be the provider for my family again. And, uh, and so for me in my head and, and it's, again, it was not their idea. It was mine because they're like, we'll take you any way we can. Um, but me showing that I'm okay, you know, smiling for people and doing that stuff gave them strength to realize that it is okay. And that I'm fine. When I wasn't smiling, when I was wincing in pain, they were concerned and their day was, was harder. And I was, you know, I can feel that there was more of a burden overall in our life. And so what I chose to do is I chose to do things to kind of not mask it, but to learn how to tolerate it, learn how to focus that pain into something else, something more productive. So that's awesome. Yeah. I think that's, one of the things that inspires me the most about your story is your ability to put the pain aside and do the things that you want to do and show that you're um, as capable now as you were before, really. Yeah, well, and, you know, just to make sure and to clarify, my pain is never gone. It never goes away. Every time I take a step, I have shooting pain that goes up my prosthetic leg into my spinal cord and back down. It never goes away. Winters are awful. I, I, you know, I feel every bit of those surgeries, the scar tissue, and, and I get it, and it's hard. And there are days where I totally want medicine, but what I realize is it's not going to cure my injuries. It's not going to fix it. For me, it's a Band-Aid on a bullet hole where, you know, if, if it's not going to help me, then I need to find something else that will. I need to try to find a different outlet. So I found health and fitness. I found trying to work with other people and helping other people to solve their own problems. One of the army values is selfless service. And it's something that I continue to live by to this day. And my favorite definition of that is putting the welfare and care of others before your own. 
And I have to tell you that there is some serious power in that. And, and, I, and I started to do it to help people, and now it's, it's half and half. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I love to help people. I love to do things for people and to serve people. But I also do get something out of it. It helps me to, to, to overcome my personal obstacles every single day. It helps me to realize that it's okay. It could be worse. It could be worse. And I tell myself that every day, and it helps me to not focus on myself, to, but to focus on the bigger picture. Um, it's very easy to get caught up on my, on yourself when you're going through struggles and trials. And when you get caught up on yourself, that's when you know examples of the world and other people can even bring you even further down. And it's an easy, it's an easy way to do it because that's a downhill road. Um, but I like to think of myself as constantly trying to pull myself and climb up this stupid mountain, you know, rock by rock, uh, as I'm going through my obstacles. And as I help people, it helps me to climb just a little bit further and it makes it to where I don't really focus so much on my own situation. That's awesome. Well, that's, that's an awesome perspective that I haven't heard you share before. Um, so I guess to summarize what is motivating you since you've had the injury and you've had all these surgeries and have ongoing physical, um, ailments, you said that one was helping people in service. You've also mentioned that you want that role of being a father. Um, and then you mentioned the health and fitness as well. Is there anything else that helps you to keep that positive attitude that everyone knows you for? Well, so um, I, I'm a big believer in surrounding yourself with people around people that are, are going to bring out the best in you. Um, and I love to associate with people that are better than me in every aspect of my life. And I believe I do that, whether it's at my home, because my wife is a million times better than I'll ever be. My <laughs> kids are, I'm so grateful that, that I have my beautiful, my three beautiful children. Um, but they're not like me. And thankfully, because they're so much better than I am. Um, my friends, people I surround myself with at church, the people I work with in the education system, they're far more experienced than I am. They have far more uh, knowledge and expertise. I like to surround myself with people that are better than me, because it always helps me to strive to be better today than I was yesterday and be better tomorrow than I was today. Um, that's something that helps to motivate me. I, I, I like to ask myself a question at the end of the night every single day. And I, and I genuinely do this. I ask myself, could I have done better with whatever situation? So let's say since I'm a, a school teacher, I ask myself at the end of the day, could I have done better at teaching my students? Could I have done better at trying to inspire them, to give them tools that they're going to need to survive when they become adults and have real life decisions? Mm -hmm. Could I have been a better husband? Could I have been a better father with the time that I have with my kids at night? Um, there's a lot of times I could answer yes, almost all the time, actually, because we can always improve. But I like to take stock of myself because I'm always trying to be better. I'm trying to be a good father, trying to be a good friend, trying to be a good teacher, because I believe that in our lives, no matter what obstacles we have, no matter what trials we have or circumstances that we're given, um, we're given them for a reason. And if we can learn from them, we can actually use them to help a lot of people. It could just be our immediate family. It could be people we run into in our business or on a bigger scale. Um, whatever that avenue is, um, you know, we're meant to be able to share these experiences with people and try to help them through their own adversity because everybody has their own adversity. Everybody has their own obstacles. They may not be, you know, dramatic explosions, but they're theirs and they're genuine and they're real. And they affect them in, in ways that are just like mine. And, and so I, I rely wholly on those examples. I rely on my friends. I rely on my family. My family is, again, my, my keystone, for, for lack of a better word. You know, I love, I love, and I look forward to talking with my kids at the dinner table, talking to them about their day, <laughs> asking them what they did, just hearing their little experiences and their personalities come out. I love watching them grow and I love being a part of that. Um, that to me is the best motivator because you know, to be able to try to do your part to make sure that your kids are going to be great contributors to society, to our, our great nation, is a is a big task because there's a lot of challenges that these kids face that we never faced before 
but they they are better than us. And if we can just help shape them and, and mold them and, and guide them on the path that they need to do for their best growth, to be them best selves, there's things that these kids can do that would just blow our minds in the future. And I'm just excited to be a part of that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Travis, for sharing your story with us. I'm grateful to call you my friend and constantly inspired by you. Thank you to everyone who has listened to this inspiring interview. Travis and his wife, Stephanie, are going to publish a book, and when it is available, I will link it to this show. Please tune in to the next episode to learn about Travis's Olympic hand cycling pursuits and how competition drives him. If you gained anything from this podcast, please share it with someone you know. Please also subscribe and leave a review wherever you are listening. And if you are wanting to leave a comment or ask questions, please do so on this episode on YouTube at Primed Fatherhood. Thank you for listening and stay primed. Thank you.